Good morning. Good morning and welcome. It's wonderful to see everybody here this morning. Uh, great to gather together in, in, in worship and in song and, and hear from your word, uh, hear from God's word. And uh, uh, good to have our, our uh, online family as well. Uh, before we begin, a couple of announcements. Uh, we have our scheduled uh, Santa parade, or Christmas parade today. So that was supposed to be last week's, but uh, because of weather, we're, we're having it today. And as such, uh, we will not have our 5 p.m. Zoom class tonight. So uh, just make note of that. Uh, and uh, one more note, the, uh, there are several uh, teacher cookie packages in the foyer. So in the lobby, so if you uh, did not get one of those, make sure you stop by and, and uh, get a, a packet of cookies for all you teachers. Let's, uh, let's have a prayer and then we'll begin our song service. Lord, we thank you for your presence as we know you, uh, you've promised us such. And we, we pray that as we worship you, that you uh, fill us with your spirit and you'll allow the, the music to to encourage us and to encourage each other. And we pray that uh, you are present in the, in the preparation of everything that uh, will happen today and uh, that you will uh, let us learn from your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sing. 
Let's join our hearts and minds in prayer this morning. Father, we're so blessed to be able to be here today. Lord, we're thankful for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with. Lord, we're thankful that we can come before you with our cares and and Lord, we pray that we always approach you in humility and and uh, realizing uh, how awesome you are and and how wonderful you are to us. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for this season when uh, many people who normally don't think about you are are stopping to remember Jesus at this time. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would grant us opportunities to to encourage uh, those around us and encourage them to become seekers and and to to seek Jesus more deeply in their lives. And uh, we pray that we would always be looking for opportunities to do this all through the year, but especially now when people are are thinking about your son. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that when Jesus came to this earth that he came as Emmanuel, God with us, And Lord, because he came and was with us, he understands the struggles that we go through. And and Lord, we're thankful that he's the perfect mediator between us and you. And and it's such a comfort to know that he's our advocate because uh, we fail you in so many ways. Uh, Lord, it's really often hard to, to have faith in things that we can't see. And Lord, by Jesus coming to be with us, uh, we were able to see what you're like, and and we have an example to follow, and we just pray that that we would look to him and look for the way that he acted and lived and, and pattern our life after him. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that because we're your, those of us who are in Christ, that, that you've promised that your presence will be with us always, that we have your spirit within us that um, can give us comfort and encouragement and we just pray that we would live in a way that would honor uh, your presence within us. Lord, we're in a time of struggle and around the world and we just pray that you would shorten this pandemic that we're in, if it's your will. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would be with those who are sick uh, and those who have recovered but still have lasting effects from, from the virus. And Lord, please be with those who are caring for them that have had such a long stretch of, of extra work and, and uh, stress, and we just pray that you would give them strength and encouragement. Now, Lord, help us as we approach a new year to to seek to strive to have a a pure heart. Help us to approach your kingdom with the enthusiasm of a little child. And we pray that that our hearts would be such that our actions and our speech would overflow with with grace and, and goodness. And Lord, we pray that as we go through the rest of this worship that we would do it with all of our heart and mind. We ask these things through the name of your precious son. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Luke 2, 48 to 52. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. I gave my life for thee.
Thanks for singing loud so I could hear I was on the wrong verse. Uh, this next song, we're going to sing all three verses first before we sing the chorus. And if, if it's convenient for you, let's stand together as we sing. Good morning. Hallelujah, Christ arose. What, what a great day it is to, to sing those words with you, uh, to spend this moment with you in, in worship and listening to God's word. Welcome. If you're joining us uh, online, welcome to all of you who are here today. And Merry Christmas to all of you. It's hard to believe it, uh, but this is actually the last Sunday before Christmas, which is just right around the corner here. So, of course, I am hoping... Uh, a very safe and happy holiday to all of you and, and to your loved ones. And it's going to be a little bit of a different kind of Christmas this year, isn't it? Well, not everything's going to be different. Uh, in the corner of our living room, we've got our Christmas tree up. It's still lighting up our house, uh, just like always. Uh, Alyssa has promised to make for me lemon white chocolate scones uh, with a lemon from our garden, which is something that I look forward to every single year. Uh, we've got our lights up around the house uh, on the roof, and about once a week, uh, a certain part of those strands falls down, and I get out the ladder and put it up again, as is tradition in our house every year. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I don't need a pandemic to tell me to not go into the crowds at the mall in, in late December. That is something I've lived by for years and years. Uh, so not everything has changed this year. But there are some things that are just going to be a little different this time around. Uh, like Maybe we have some loved ones that we're not going to be able to go and see this year. Hey, in my house, uh, we've had some loved ones pass away, uh, and that changes things too. On the radio, you hear the song, there's no place like home for the holidays. But what it means to be home for the holidays is something that, for a lot of us, we're still just kind of figuring out this year. It's a different kind of Christmas season. 
And with all of those things in mind, I, I chose our passage for today. It's the last one uh, in the stories about young Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. It's a passage that begins Luke chapter 2 and verse 41. If you'd like to get out a Bible and turn there. And this passage gives to us our last glimpse into the life of Christ before his adulthood and his ministry, which begins in chapter 3 at about age 30 in his life. And while for the past few weeks we've been looking at some of the birth stories of Jesus, at a time when many people around the world might be thinking of those same stories, chances are not as many are thinking about this one here today. In this story, Jesus is no longer an infant. Jesus is 12 years old. In this story, Jesus is not in Bethlehem anymore. His family has moved to a village called Nazareth in Galilee, well to the north of Bethlehem. In this story, there are no angelic announcements. There are no stars in the sky. There are no shepherds in the field. There are no gifts at the Savior's feet. What we have instead are parents separated from their child and Jesus longing to be at home for the holidays. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 41. And as we see from, if I can get this going, as we see from the beginning of these verses, the year is Christ's twelfth year on the earth, and the holiday is upon us. For the, the Jews, it's the feast of the Passover, and this is a big one for the Jewish. People. This was a time uh, dedicated to a celebration. Uh, the Passover came at the end of actually a week-long celebration, and it was sort of the capstone, the, the, the great last day of a week of remembering God. This was a day that commemorated that greatest victory in the life of God's people when God was victorious over Pharaoh in Egypt and led his people out of slavery in Egypt. This was the day you remembered what made you a people, what made you who you are. You know, it's estimated that the city of Jerusalem had like 200,000 people in it. Well, this time of year at Passover, that number would swell up to 3 million people. That's how important this time was for the Jewish people. People just came and flocked to this city for this holiday. They would travel in large groups of their families, as we're going to see in this chapter. In large groups, they would come to be in the city. And Joseph and Mary, verse 41, are among those Crowds of people. It was their custom, we're told. They did this every year. And maybe he was with them every time. But we are told specifically that this time, 12-year-old Jesus was with them too. And this is where the story starts to get interesting. Because it just so happened that when that festival was ending, as the whole family was packing up and returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in their group, that large family traveling group, supposing him to be with them, they go a day's journey. Uh, like the McAllister family in Home Alone, one, two, three, four, and five. Pick your movie. They go a whole day's journey before they even realize that their son is not with them. And then they go and search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, that large family traveling group. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. 
And it was not until after three days. Think about that. Three of the worst vacation holiday days for Mary and Joseph and his family. Finally, they find him in the temple. And what is Jesus doing? He's sitting amongst the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and at his answers. So here he is, he's conversing and he's questioning and he's answering with all of the teachers about the scriptures and the God that they point to. And everybody is just blown away by what this child is doing. Well, almost everybody. His parents, when they saw him, they were astonished, but not in a wow, I'm so impressed kind of way. His mother said, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And isn't that the truth? Three days, they've been searching for their child. Three days, Jesus has been lost in a city that's not their own with no cell phone, no plan. I mean, what would you do? Mary's got to have that sinking feeling in her gut right now. Great distress, she says. Isn't that the truth? You can just hear it in what she says. How very painful this has been for her. To have been separated like this from her child. And it almost makes Jesus' response sound a little callous and rude. At first blush, it kind of comes across as rude until we try to look at it from his point of view. So Mary says, son, why have you done this to us? We've been searching for you in great distress. And this is what Jesus says. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house. Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? This is Jesus' response to his weary, worn out parents. And when he says it, everyone who heard it, they didn't understand what he was saying. Do you understand what he's saying? Can you see what Christ is saying from his point of view? Because from Mary's point of view, it's just so clear that these three days have just been awful. And why would Jesus do this to us? Put us through this kind of pain, this separation. But from Jesus' point of view, From Jesus' point of view, who has suffered the breach of family? Who of all people knows better than anyone what it means to be far, far away from your true home? And who at this time of Passover is just longing to be at home for the holidays? Did you not know that I needed to be in my father's house? I think if this story is showing us anything, it's showing us that Jesus is out of place. And not just in the sense that he got lost for a few days in Jerusalem. He's out of place because Jesus is the son of his father, like father with a capital F, Father in heaven. Jesus is the son of that father. And yet, where is he but here on this earth, living among us? In the words of one of the songs we sang earlier, my father's house of light 
my glory-circled throne. I left for earthly nights, for wandering sad and lone. I left, I left it all for thee. Why did Jesus leave it all? Why did he choose that earthly night? Well, this story doesn't give us the answer yet. Not yet. But it does show us that Jesus is, in a sense, out of place. Far from that house of light, suffering that most painful breach of nearness like no one has ever known. And for a moment, he just says, Can I just be, can I just be in my father's house? And no one could understand what he was saying. Not yet. However, his mother treasured up all those things in her heart. Just like we saw before. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we saw Mary do this very same thing. Treasure up all these things in her heart. She was taking the things she was seeing and hearing, things that she did not yet fully understand, but storing them up like treasures in her heart, only later to see them fully revealed. And here we have again, Jesus' mother storing up these things in her heart. Things not yet fully revealed. And Jesus went down from there with his earthly family. And Jesus came and was submissive to his parents. And it is not until many years later that those treasures come into view. And the reason why it is that Jesus left his father's house finally becomes clear. It's really not until the next time in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus returns to his father's house. In some ways, you could say that the whole Gospel of Luke is the story of that great return. In some ways, you could say that the whole gospel of Luke is, in a sense, told to us in this small story of Jesus as a boy in the temple. Because in this gospel, just like in that story we just read, Jesus is going to be journeying from Galilee to Jerusalem, from where he grew up in Galilee to the place where his father's house is. In Luke chapter 9, up to that point, Jesus has been ministering in Galilee. But then from that point forward, we're told that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem. And when he gets to Jerusalem, when does he get there? Right there in the holidays. Right there when everyone is flocking to the city by the millions. Right at the time of Passover. Just like we saw before. And when Jesus gets to Jerusalem at the Passover, do you remember where he first goes? The first place he goes when he comes into the city, he goes to the temple. He goes back directly into his father's house. And what does he do there? For this last week of his life, he is sitting amongst the teachers there. Lots of them are asking him questions. Some of them are trying to catch him in a trap. But everything that he says amazes everyone who has been listening to his words. Just like we saw glimpses of in his early life. And do you remember when Jesus was a boy in the temple? Do you remember how he told them what he must do? I must be in my father's house. And how did they respond? Well, they didn't understand what he was saying. Well, all throughout this journey in the gospel, Jesus has been telling them what he must do, what he is here to do. And yet, 
chapter 9. Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what he was saying. Chapter 18. See, we are going to Jerusalem and everything that is written will be accomplished. He'll be delivered uh, to the Gentiles, be mocked, shamefully treated, spat upon, flogged, killed. And on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. You see, just like when Jesus was a boy in the temple, 12 years old and longing to be in his father's house, all throughout this journey that follows, people are not yet understanding what Jesus must do. And then the day comes. And just like he had spoken, he's arrested and he's handed over. He's mocked and he's beaten. They put him on a cross, not far away from the place where he had said so many years before, I must be in my father's house. And just like that, he was gone. Just like that. All hope with him. The one who left his father's house of light was buried in the tomb. The one who left that glory circled throne had truly left it all. And on the first day of the week at dawn, some women went to go to the tomb. When they got there, they found that the stone was rolled away from the tomb, but they went inside the tomb. They did not find Jesus there. They didn't find him. He's lost. And while they were perplexed about this, two men stand there with them in dazzling apparel, and they're frightened. They fall down, bowing their faces to the ground. And what do the men say to them? Why are you looking for Jesus? Why are you seeking the living among the dead? Remember what Jesus said to Mary in Luke chapter 2? Why are you looking for me? Why are you seeking me? Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. So for three days he was lost in that temple and now at the cross. On that morning his body was missing. They seek him but cannot find him. And then the angel says what Jesus said. Why are you seeking after me? Why do you seek the living among the dead? For yes, he was lost, but no longer. After three days in the temple, he was found. And remember how he told you that on the third day, he would rise again. And in all of these things, we begin to see what wasn't yet clear before. We begin to see why it is that Jesus left his father's house, left that heavenly throne, suffered that painful separation from the father that he loved. In the fullness of time, we start to really see why he left it all. Why he suffered that painful distance. Jesus left it all so that we might be home for the holidays. So that our separations in this life, though they are painful, might ultimately be temporary. 
Jesus left his father's house so that even the most painful separation, that of death itself, even that might be overcome. Jesus left it all to continue our song from before that he might bring to thee down from my home above Salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. That's why Jesus left it all. He left his home so that we might find a home together forever with him in his father's house. You know, these days, as we've said, we're, we're dealing with a, a very different kind of Christmas. We're, we're dealing with a very different kind of year. And, you know, we may not know what it's like to lose your 12-year-old in ancient Jerusalem, but we do know what it's like to feel the pain of being separated from the people that we love, whether that's by this pandemic or by other things, fractured relationships, long distances, obligations, or even by death itself, those things can cause us, like Mary, great distress and pain in our hearts. They're real struggles that we deal with. But as painful as those things may be, and they are, at least we have the hope today because of Jesus that even those things can be, in the end, overcome. Because Jesus shared in those very same pains when he left his father's home. And Jesus overcame even those things at the cross when after three days he was found again. And when Jesus departed from our world, he made a promise to us, a promise that gives us real hope now and forever. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also, together with me and all those who put their trust in me. In Jesus' Father's house. Well, maybe this is something you need to hear today. Maybe you can take hope in this message today that the things we face in this life are real but can be overcome in the hope that Jesus gives. Maybe you take comfort in knowing that Christ also face some of the things that we go through in dealing with a time far away from his home in bearing those burdens for our sake and for our benefit. Maybe the way you respond to this message today is by answering Jesus' voice calling you to come home. When we respond to the good news of Jesus, we are doing what that promise said, believing in God, believing also in him, and letting God prepare you for that place to come. However you may be called or challenged today, let's remember what Christ has done for us while we stand and while we sing.
We'll sing the song in preparation for the observance of our Lord's Supper. I will, I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. We are now in the final week before Christmas. Plans are being made for family get-togethers and meals. It may be different this year, but it's still going to happen. We're still trying to maintain our social distance. Stores are being decorated and have been decorated for quite a while with all sorts of lights and decorations. We're being inundated with countless advertisements and glitz to encourage us to buy bigger, better, and fancier gifts than we ever have before. But what actually makes a good gift or a memorable gift? Does it have to cost a lot of money? Not necessarily, it can. Sometimes a person might need a timely update to a car or a home and can't afford it themselves, so it is gifted to them. Quite often, however, gifts are inexpensive and spur of the moment gifts and are more of a gesture of kindness and friendship than any cost or utility. Do gifts have to be bought or can they be made? Sometimes they can be bought, but quite often they're made. There is not a choice, but a gift that will have to be purchased. The ones that are most memorable for me are the gifts that I have made for someone else or the ones that have been made for me. The more specific and personal that a gift becomes, the more impact it actually could have. Every time we think about that gift or see that gift, it brings back the joy and the elation we felt when we received it, but it also helps us consider the sacrifice and the time that it took for that gift to be made. There's a special gift that each one of us have received that cost absolutely no money to anybody. No gift can measure the weight, the importance, and sacrifice of Jesus' death on the cross. When we celebrate communion, we remember the gift of salvation that Jesus gives each one of us. It symbolizes the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. The bread and the juice represent the blood and the body of Jesus. The body that was poured out and broken as a sacrifice for our gift of salvation. 
Just like some gifts will always remind us of a friend or a family member, the communion always reminds us of Jesus and the gift of salvation that we specially crafted and lovingly made for each one of us. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord and Father, we come to you now asking you to remind us of the time that you sent your son as a special gift for us to die on the cross for our sins. Let us take this time to remember that death and the gift that we did not make, could not have made, but you yourself made for us. Let us remember the body that was pierced at this time. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. You continue with me in prayer. Lord and Father, we come before you again, asking you to again to remind us of the blood that was shed on the cross through your Son, through that special gift of the blood sacrifice that was made for us. Help us remember again that that was a gift that you made for us. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Our final prayer today will take uh, the place of our uh, gift for the offering that we have and also for our closing prayer. If you have an offering and you're here at the service today, you can place those in the baskets at the end of our uh, service hall. Would you pray with me, please? Lord and Father, we want to come to you once again to thank you for everything you've given us, how you have blessed us in this world. Everything you give us has been a gift uh, from you. We want to thank you for everything we have. We want to be able to do everything we can to help you further. Please bless the money that is given to us today and help the elders to decide what is best to be done with this money. We ask you to be with each one of us as we go from this service today and help us to all come back at the next appointed time. Help everyone who is traveling this holiday season to be safe and to arrive safely and come back home to their families. Be with those uh, family members who have lost other family members and help them to get through this time through your services. It's your name we pray, amen.